So Dr. Scholz, in February of this year, 2022, the New England Journal of Medicine came out with a study saying that surgery was superior to EBRT radiation in patients with very high risk disease. Can you give us some light on this study? Um, this actually contradicts other studies that we've read. It's hard to uh, address this without a few charts and graphs, but the um, when you looked at the bottom line differences, they were talking about a couple percentage points in, uh, in extended survival an advantage for the patients that had uh, had surgery. The problem is, is that this study was a retrospective database review. It wasn't a clinical trial. So they just looked at a lot of people that had surgery and a lot of people that had radiation, and where were they uh, five or 10 years later? So it wasn't really a direct comparative trial. And we know that patients having surgery are different than patients having radiation. Uh, the surgeons that uh, biopsy and diagnose these patients. They select younger men, healthier men, uh, stronger men to have operations, and they tend to shunt the weaker, more advanced age men toward radiation. It's sensible, but it, you're not really comparing apples and apples. You're comparing different groups of people in different age groups. Older people don't have immune systems that are as strong and, and this sort of thing. But there's probably something more here than simply differences in patient groups. The um, there is uh, one uh, tiny advantage for surgery over radiation. That is the monitoring process that goes on after people have the operation. The prostate's completely removed, and if the PSA doesn't go all the way down to zero, you immediately know there's persistent cancer, and it triggers more aggressive, earlier stage uh, additional therapy. Many of the men that have high-risk disease that have surgery end up having radiation as well. So it's not surgery versus radiation, it's surgery plus radiation versus radiation. And uh, I'd say, well, okay, that's not desirable to have two treatments rather than one, but if there's a slight improvement in survival, maybe it's worth it. My response to that would be that there are other ways to initiate early aggressive therapy in the radiation patients that can, uh, when properly implemented, can match the early treatment that the surgical patients are getting. We have PSMA PET scans now. We have other ways to detect early progression in our radiation patients that we didn't previously have. I think the other problem with the trial is that it's been well established that uh, to get good control of large tumors in the prostate, you need brachytherapy. You need a uh, high dose of radiation that really can't be achieved with beam radiation. This is, the IMRT is a type of beam radiation. And so to treat high-risk patients with IMRT alone is probably not state-of-the-art care. People are always trying to get a simplistic black and white answer between surgery and radiation. Sadly, the, um, the actual difference was so small, one to two percentage points, that uh, it's only gonna affect one out of 50 men and, and uh, their outcome in an outcome that would be different. Makes for good conversation. I'm glad it gives me another chance to tell people to avoid surgery, uh, that they do need to get state-of-the-art care. It does make a difference. People that get treated better with more aggressive early stage treatment will have better outcomes and better survival. Another question we have, we have a 66 year old who has Gleason 9 prostate cancer and he's decided that he wants proton therapy. He does have a medical oncologist. The oncologist told him that he needs two months of hormone therapy before he receives the proton therapy and the radiologist is saying you don't need the hormone therapy. It doesn't matter when you get it, you can get it afterwards. So he would like your opinion on which to do. Well, there, this controversy has been going on because there are different trials uh, uh, particularly ones in the past that advocated a two-month lead-in. Uh, but I think that the radiation therapist in this case is accurate because the more recent trials suggest that the timing of the hormone treatment is not that critical. Of course, now again, with PSMA PET scans, we have to question um, whether we even need hormone therapy at all. Uh, the hormone therapy has uh, some improvement in getting uh, better local control rates. Again, we try and uh, achieve those better local control rates with brachytherapy rather than, than uh, beam radiation. But the hormone therapy primarily has an advantage for treating potential micrometastatic disease outside the prostate. And uh, the new PSMA PET scans are very good at detecting that. And when people have clear scans, it uh, raises the question of how much hormone therapy do you really need? I think you said he had a Gleason 9, and uh, those historically would be treated with about 18 months of hormone therapy, and uh, not four months, which you mentioned, but uh, 
if someone had a negative PSMA PET scan, then maybe a mere four months of therapy would be a reasonable guess as to what's optimal. We don't really have clinical trials yet validating precisely what is the best approach for these patients now now that we have these PSMA PET scans. So we have a patient who has Gleason 8 prostate cancer, and they're wondering if there's a rationale to do genomic testing. Uh, basically, they're trying to figure out if they should radiate the lymph nodes uh, without a PSMA scan to see, just radiate them just, just in case there may be some metastatic activity there, and if the genomic test would give them some evidence to do so. Well, wouldn't counsel people to try and, uh, you know, uh, blaze their own trail in diagnostic, uh, you know, the, the different methodologies that have been worked out for low, intermediate, and high-risk prostate cancer are substantiated by a number of clinical trials. So the idea of genomic testing is useful, I think, for patients that are at a tipping point. And this, in the prostate world, usually is that men that have three plus four, um, they're thinking about watching versus treating their, their favorable intermediate risk prostate cancer. And uh, the genomic testing, I think, can be useful in that setting to give a sense of whether it is safe to go on active surveillance or not. Men that have four plus four are definitely gonna need definitive therapy. And the decision about whether or not to extend therapy beyond to cover lymph nodes is a very important one. I don't think genomic testing is the way to answer that question. I think that the need for a PSMA PET scan in this modern era is you know, non-negotiable. Uh, the, uh, if someone's insurance doesn't cover it, I would pay for it. Uh, it's worth uh, the money to find out if you need to be on extended hormone therapy, possibly even chemotherapy if they find lymph node involvement on the scan. Uh, and then uh, if the scans are clear, that um, then it makes sense to really dial down the therapy and reduce the amount of hormone therapy or even eliminate the hormone therapy. So. Very important question, but I don't think genomic testing is the way to answer the question. So you've mentioned the concept of reducing the length of hormone therapy when it comes to patients who have clear PSMA scans with metastatic activity or no metastatic activity. That is that a common thing? Like, could they go to any oncologist and have that conversation? What are your tips for patients when maybe they have an oncologist who says you automatically have to go on 18 months of hormone therapy? That's uh, for the patient to challenge that is a little bit of a... Uh, hardship sometimes. You know, there's a lot of variables. How old is the patient and what are their goals? And uh, after they do get on hormone therapy, how w well are they tolerating it? Can they stay on it without much difficulty or, or perhaps they're having a lot of trouble? And this is all based in this concept of shared decision making and to have a dialogue with your expert, your physician, who's carefully listening to what the patient's personal goals are and, and bouncing these ideas back and forth. And this becomes particularly important in an era now where we don't have long-term outcomes using different methodologies uh, in the context of the PSMA PET information. Uh, so we've got this new information about whether or not there's any lymph node involvement. It's not perfect information, but it's much more accurate than anything we've ever had before. And so it seems ridiculous to completely ignore it and just do things the way they've always been done because in the past we had to give additional treatment as insurance against the possibility of something being outside the prostate. And it was a very sensible and logical approach, which is now outdated in the context of these new scans. Uh, so it's not gonna be a black and white issue. I think, yes, it's essential for patients to have a conversation with their physicians, make sure that the doctors are aware of the existence of these new scans. They've only been commercially available for a few months. so. Uh, it's quite possible that uh, their urologist or their oncologist doesn't even know about PSMA PET scans. Thanks so much for watching. If you would like more information about prostate cancer and all sorts of education, you can visit our website, pcri.org, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We come out with new prostate cancer education videos every week.